This presentation forms part of the Rome Wasn't Learned in a Day series, sponsored by Australia Nova Romana and presented here by Decimus Aurelius Inginarius. In this feature, we will explore the scenario in which the player can become a rebel governor and may now use their local forces and garrisons to revolt against the Senate. Rebel Governors is an advanced rule under section 2.03 of the 1.06 Alpha Living Rule set. For this scenario, all players have just reached the Senate phase and have just reached the gubernatorial agenda item. The developed and very prosperous province of Macedonia finds itself in need of a new governor. Your faction negotiates with the remainder of the Senate about how your senator, Sir Willius, would make a great candidate to fulfil the governorship role. Your political tit-for-tat pays off, and the Senate agrees with the appointment. Sir Willius now leaves the Senate and Rome to take up his new role in the province. With carefully placed words from your faction, the Senate grows concerned about barbarian raids in frontier provinces like these. As such, they pass a proposal to bolster your Macedonian province with two legion garrisons. There are two avenues a rebel governor can take to achieve victory. In any given revolution phase that one of your senators is a governor, abiding to the highest ranking available officer turn order, you can declare your governor to be in rebellion. At that point, you must decide whether your new rebel will immediately march on Rome or take a more initial passive approach. Firstly, we will explore the scenario in which an immediate declaration to march on Rome is made. Sir Willius is declared in rebellion during the revolution phase. As there are no other rebel declarations sporting a higher force strength, Sir Willius will obtain the primary rebel title. At this point, you can declare any secondary rebels from your faction. For this example, we will declare one other to support Sir Willius through Fabius. Upon declaring as a rebel, those senators lose all concessions, public offices and knights and are no longer able to claim the benefits from them. To calculate the force strength of the rebel who will march on Rome, we consider all forces he currently controls. Firstly, those two garrison legions come in handy and will each contribute to the total force value. The provincial legions listed on the province dial will likely make up the bulk of the force. Normally provincial forces count for half, rounded up, but due to the presence of provincial garrisons, they count for full value. As a result, we in fact have eight provincial legions. Finally, Sir Willius has a legion allegiance marker for the 6th legion. They will also join him in his rebellion. Sir Willius also gets to add his military rating to the total, a further 3 added to the force strength. This will give the rebel a total force strength of 15. Province-based strength value is not considered in the calculation of a rebel's force strength when marching on Rome. And although not needed in this case, we can calculate the rebel's fleet strength from the province-based fleet strength of the provincial fleets listed. This gives the rebel a total of 10 in fleet strength. Our new rebel, Sir Willius, steps through the seven phases like all other senators, but with a few differences now. Come the revenue phase, we now have to calculate the income he will receive, which is different for a rebel. All his revenue comes from the province he governs and is shown on the province card. So let's run through an example, starting with provincial spoils. After a roll, let's assume he gets nine. He also collects the state income, a 2d6 plus two, which will state he rolls and gets seven. Finally, he'll also assume control of the local taxes. With no role required, he'll receive a whopping 40 talents. This is all the income he receives, 
as he can no longer collect his state senatorial income. He can no longer benefit from concessions. He also can't utilize knights any longer. Now that Sir Willius has collected his income, he now must pay for the legions and forces following him. Not doing so means they will desert him. Starting the calculation with his provincial armies, there are eight of those. Therefore, that is a total of 16 talents. He has five provincial fleets in strength that will cost him 10. Being accompanied by the two legion garrisons, that is a further four talents. There are no standard fleets for him to worry about, so that is zero cost. Finally, a rebel must also pay for his base province strength, in this case five, therefore costing him ten talents. This results in a total bill of forty talents. To pay this cost, a rebel can pay from his personal treasury, the treasury of secondary rebels, or from their faction treasury. Having observed the Senate phase pass by, Sir Willius is now ready to take on and attack the Senate. The Senate would have no doubt passed a proposal to send a force to meet him. Not doing so would result in the rebel instantly winning. Normally for the rebel to enter Italy, he has to pass through and fight a naval interception. But as he has elected to march on Rome immediately from declaration, he is considered to already have arrived in Italy and be able to attack Rome. A naval interception is not required in this case. Sir Willius is considered to be threatening Rome from within Italy, and he has now considered an active war against the Senate with a strength of 15, as we calculated earlier. To avoid instant defeat, the Senate musters a force under field consul Cassius. However, and not to the surprise of the rebel faction, the Senate has been struggling financially and can only raise nine legions against him. As the Senate is considered to be attacking the rebel, the strength difference here is minus six. In this example, let's assume Cassius rolls well, say a 10. However, the combat result is terrible for the Senate, and when verified against the combat results table, it shows a humiliating defeat and a victory for the rebel. In a slightly different variation, let's assume the Senate managed to muster 13 legions. This will give a strength difference of only minus two. We'll keep to the same example roll here of 10. This will fall to a result of eight, marginally better for the Senate, but still not a great outcome for either side. A stalemate for this value will cost the senatorial force five legions and five fleets. The Senate essentially loses all of the likely five support fleets required of this battle. Cassius also suffers the loss of two popularity, a popularity point for each two legions loss rounded down. As this was not a victory for the Senate force, Cassius will move on as a proconsul, and the Senate will have to decide in the next Senate phase if he stays to fight this rebellion. The rebel suffer the same fate. Using the provincial loss algorithm, Sir Willius will lose four provincial armies. He will also lose one of the two garrison legions. Both leaders here must also survive a death chip draw equal to the amount of legions lost. In this case, they both survive to carry on the war. In that second example, where the Senate was able to support a larger force, our rebel was not able to claim victory. For every battle not won makes it harder for our rebel to claim an overall win. He will now have to pay for his remaining forces again through the next revenue phase. Let's analyze what our rebel can do and see what a more passive approach could look like. In this scenario, Sir Willius chooses to declare himself in rebellion but opts to not immediately march on Rome. The only way a rebel can win in this case is if the Senate succumbs to citizen unrest or the state treasury becomes bankrupt. 
the rebel also has to defend against attacks should the Senate decide to send a force against what is now another active war. Here, the Senate has appointed a command and is sending a force against our new rebel, Sir Willius. For those provinces in rebellion that have a fleet strength greater than zero will normally require a naval battle first. This will occur if the rebel governor's fleet strength exceeds the underdeveloped province base land value. As his fleet strength is a combination of provincial fleets and military rating, eight, this exceeds the base five land strength and will result in a naval battle. Let's assume the Senate gets lucky and defeats the rebel in a naval battle. The province now gains a naval victory marker and the active war against the rebel is considered prosecuted this turn. The Senate now prepares for the land battle. The rebel strength is slightly larger in this case, taking into account the province-based land strength as well. The Senate will face a force of 20 in strength. In this example, the Senate sends forward 14 legions. The Senate is still required to have fleet support for this battle. We'll assume they wiped the rebels' provincial fleets aside in the previous engagement, leaving just five of the base fleet strength of the province. The strength difference for the pending land battle is going to be minus six. We'll use our example roll of 10 once more. This leads to a terrible defeat for the Senate. The Senate suffers the necessary losses required, and as this was a defeat for the Senate, the rebel does not lose any of his forces. But this does not result in a rebel victory. A rebel has to win a victory against the Senate while marching on Rome. Changing tact slightly, in this example, Sir Williams concludes that the waiting game isn't working out and changes his mind and decides to attack Rome. Rebels marching on Rome that do not immediately attack after decoration are subject to a naval interception. A naval interception occurs when the province naval strength is greater than zero, as is the case for Macedonia. Let's assume the rebels' fleet strength is still 10 in this scenario. The Senate's fleet strength is whatever is present in the active forces box. Let's say it was six. The strength difference here is minus four, as it is still considered the Senate is the one attacking. We'll use our standard example role of 10 again. This leads us to a heavy defeat for the Senate fleet. Both sides will take the required naval losses, but only fleets are lost. The rebel acquires victory and lands on the Italian peninsula to now attack Rome. Whether Sir Willius, as a rebel, waited and passed a naval interception to attack Rome, or attacked Rome immediately from declaration, he now finds himself at Rome's doorstep. Here he will fight until glory or death, never returning to the province. Let's go back and consider the scenario where he drew a stalemate against the Senate in a previous battle. In the revolution phase, following a stalemate, a rebel has the option to call for reinforcements from any one secondary rebel. In this example, it just so happens that our secondary rebel was also a rebel governor. The governor of Gallia Narbonesis. He brings with him provincial armies as well as a veteran legion. Our rebel lost a third of his forces in the previous stalemate, and this reinforcement will rebolster our rebel in this scenario back to a force of 16. Reinforcement actions like this are subject to a naval interception. However, a naval interception is only required when the associate province has a base naval strength greater than zero. In this case, a naval interception is not required and Fabius makes it to Italy to reinforce Servilius. Now in the combat phase, the Senate sends their approved force of only 12 legions. Calculating the strength difference gives us minus 4. Using our example roll again, 
A good one of 10 still results in a heavy defeat for the Senate and hands victory to the rebellion. In this presentation, we explore the two paths in which a rebel governor can claim victory. A rebel can make his declaration and immediately march on Rome, thus avoiding a naval interception. A rebel can also choose to wait out and seek the collapse of Rome, relying in his base land strength to ward off Senate attacks. A rebel who chooses to delay his march on Rome can still call for reinforcements after any stalemate result. This has been part of the Rome Wasn't Learned in a Day series, presented by D. Aurelius Ingenarius. Have feedback? Send your thoughts to ostnovaroma at outlook.com. That's A-U-S-T, Novaroma at outlook.com.